So, one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest issues in spiritual life is selecting a guru. Of course, you want a realized soul, huh? <laughs> Confirmed. The bird is back. <laughs> Anyways, he's hanging out on the back wall trying to attract some females. He was doing his dance before, you know. <laughs> But they weren't showing up, so I fed him some peanuts, and now he's a little happier, but he's still probably going to be cranky. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> peacocks. <laughs> How do you recognize a guru? How do you recognize someone who knows or has realized something you haven't? It's a big problem. It's a big issue. So what do people do? They project what they want or what they think enlightenment should look like. And then they go looking for somebody like that. Uh, oh, I could tell so many stories. <laughs> I think the best story is in 1984, I attained first path enlightenment. And you know, I mean, you know, you don't need anybody to tell you that you're enlightened. You don't need anybody to tell you that you, you realize something very important. You just know. In fact, there's a sutta somewhere where the Buddha says, when you reach enlightenment, in the actual moment of enlightenment, there's no thoughts. But the very next thought that arises in the mind is enlightened. Confirmed. <laughs> you know. So when that happened to me in 1984, even though I didn't exactly understand everything about it the way I do now, I knew and I had no doubt that I was enlightened. So I was there in Oregon. I had just done a long uh, visit to Rancho Rajneesh. I was there for like six months. That's a long time in a place like that. It's really intense and there's a lot going on all the time. A lot of drama. So it struck me that, you know, Osho Rajneesh is like a joker type person. He's always joking. In fact, he likes to say things like, you can be sure when I'm joking that I'm absolutely serious. And you can be absolutely sure when I'm serious that I'm joking. Blech. Huh? Mind fuck. So <laughs> he attracted a certain type of people because of that. He attracted jokers. Confirmed. And in fact, in that group, I think there was a higher percentage of sociopaths than I've ever seen in any, any group before or since. Or like my Adi Guru. My Adi Guru, besides being self-realized, was a very astute businessman and politician. So, what kind of people did he attract as his principal disciples? Businessmen and politicians. Only they forgot the self-realized part. <laughs> they didn't do much sadhana, but they did a lot of politics and a lot of business. I'll never forget the first time I went to the Miami temple, the Miami Iskand temple. There was a friend with me and this guy was kind of a scammer, kind of a rascal, you know. You know, the kind of guy, tall and lean and thin and, you know, has a comeback for everything, and, you know, that kind of guy. 
So he was with me just out of curiosity, I guess. We went to the temple. And as we're walking up to the temple, he points to a guy hanging out on the, uh, the terrace of the temple. And he says, I bet that's the leader. And I look at the guy and I don't get any spiritual vibes from him at all. And I say, no, come on, that can't be the leader. <laughs> so we go in and one thing leads to another. And guess what? He was the leader. <laughs> and guess what? He didn't have any spiritual vibes. <laughs> So anyway, I interrupted my story to tell those stories. 1984, after I got first path realization, I said, I'm out of here, man. I'm taking a break. I'm going to go explore the Pacific. So the first stop was Hawaii and uh, Maui specifically. And on Maui, I gave a, a workshop on Tantra. You know, my mother was a Tantrika. I've been practicing Tantra my whole life, right? And so I gave the workshop, promoted the workshop through a local uh, New Age store and gave uh, two or three previews, free preview events to sign people up. A lot of people showed up. But pretty much all of them had a preconceived notion of what a guru should be. Like there were a lot of people from Yogi Bhajan, 3HO, Happy Healthy Holy Organization, uh -huh, with their distinctive white turbans and stuff like that. They didn't get it at all. And there were a lot of Rajneeshis too, dressed in red. Uh -huh. They didn't get it either. And then there were the usual bogus yogis. We call them bogies. <laughs> Indians will understand. Bhoga means sense enjoyment. So instead of yogis, we call them bogies because they're so much interested in sex life and stuff like that. So a bunch of those guys showed up. They didn't get it. Huh? Only a few people who were, you know, relatively humble and smart enough to admit that they didn't really know what an enlightened person should be like, they stuck around and took the workshop. And well, that's a whole nother story. But the point is, the ones who were looking for a specific type of person, they didn't find that. Because I'm not like anybody else, you know, <laughs> you notice that, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I have my radical tantric sex life and all this stuff. But I don't come on with that kind of ego. You know, like in India, there's something called a boss face. You know, this long face, right? And um, a lot of people look for that in a, a spiritual teacher. They want to be told what to do, what to think even. And then there's the people, you know, like the Rajneeshis, who are all kind of rascalies themselves, a lot of therapists and people like that, you know. So they went to Rajneesh because he was the same kind of person, very into psychology and playing tricks on people and stuff like this. And then there were the businessmen and politicians that went to Prabhupada. So what kind of person is going to come to me? I don't know. <laughs> but here's the thing. I stayed in Maui for like a year and a half. And then after that, I went to Guam. And then I went to a lot of little islands in the South Pacific, like Kiribati and Palau and Yap and places you never heard of, right? And these are very, very humble, simple, natural people in these places. I got along with them fine. I had a lot of friends in Maui, mostly musicians. And there was not a single, you know, North Americano among them. 
They were all Filipinos, Hawaiians, Japanese, uh, you know, all a, a different mix of people from a lot of different places, but no Americans. And they told me, they used, they used to confide in me, was how, we don't like Americans. Why are you so different? <laughs> well, because since December 21st, 1984, I haven't had an ego. Now, you're gonna say, well then, how do you get it together to make all these videos and organize everything and give all this knowledge and deal with all these people and blah, blah, blah? And the answer is, I have what's called a teacher's ego. See, the Buddha said there's two kinds of enlightenment, with remainder and without remainder. And by remainder, he meant a certain kind of ego. So one could have a teaching ego like the Buddha himself, or like Ramana Maharshi. Or one could have, without remainder, no ego, and then he simply becomes very silent, and nobody can recognize that he's enlightened. There's a good story about Ramana. One time Ramana announced to all his people in the morning, Today, an enlightened man is going to come and visit. And so everybody was like, you know, looking, uh, you know, who, who is it? Who is it? And at the end of the day, somebody spoke up and said, uh, Bhagavan, where, where was that enlightened man who was coming today? And he said, oh, he came, he sat for some time, and then he left. The point is, none of them could recognize him because he was enlightened without remainder. He was gone. Like my sannyas guru, Jnana Shakti Swami. Uh, I had a big fight with some of the sadhus when he left his body. I wanted to bury him in a nice samadhi like is the custom with realized beings. And they refused to accept him as being realized. I said to them, do you think I would accept him as a guru if he wasn't realized? And they said, what is the proof? See, they wanted to see mystical powers. See, they wanted to see somebody who could establish a big organization. They wanted to see somebody who had a lot, a lot of knowledge and would throw it around and impress people. Because that's their idea. That's what they want to be like when they're enlightened. <laughs> so they were projecting. And they were, they were seeing, well, this guy doesn't fit in. He's just an ordinary, friendly guy. Yeah, that's because he has no ego. <laughs> He's enlightened without remainder. He doesn't have any ax to grind. He doesn't have any desires. Uh, I could see him because I could see what's in him. I could recognize him, but the others could not. So this is the problem in spiritual life. And this is why so many seekers, even though they may be sincere, they pick somebody as a teacher or as a guru who leads them astray who, you know, takes them far afield off the spiritual path and into quest for mystical powers or sense enjoyment or money or power or whatever. Because they have that kind of ego. They may even be enlightened. They may even be realized. But because they still have a thin shell of ego to deal with the world, they attract the same kind of people whose aims may not really be self-realization, but they may be to become a guru themselves, and they're willing to use their teacher to gain credibility and establish their position for the future. Strategy, you know? This is politics, this is business. This is not spiritual life. When one approaches a guru, one should be there only to do sadhana, only to do service and to attain the complete enlightenment 
and self-realization and, and not to attain some material ends. And that's why nobody can recognize me or very, very few can recognize me because I don't put on a boss face. Huh? I'm not into organizations or power or politics or even money. I have enough money to live comfortably, that's enough. I'm satisfied. And I have a very strong sense of integrity. So I check people when they come to me because I got burned so badly in the past by so-called disciples who actually had no integrity. Now, maybe I've gone to the opposite extreme. <laughs> I test people whether they can keep their word and guess what? 95% fail. They make a promise, they say they're going to do something, and then they don't do it. They say what they think they need to say to satisfy me in the moment. And then they go off and do whatever they're going to do. I don't buy that. So I don't accept anybody like that as a disciple or even as a student. That's the thing. So I remain without disciples, and maybe I have a few students here and there. Huh? Sometimes they get in touch, and sometimes they don't. But the point is, if you're looking for something in a spiritual master, check yourself. If what you're looking for is somebody who represents your desires or the fulfillment of your desires you're probably barking up the wrong tree better you should come to understand consciousness and then get self-realized yourself and then it'll be very easy for you to recognize those who are actually self-realized Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.